Welcome to Amazing Histories. I'm Gary Ow and he's Lawrence Gray. Amazing Histories today will cover the invasion of Tibet by a guy named Francis Young Husband. How did he invade Tibet? Well, he did it with a uh, couple of thousand uh, Indian troops and a hell of a lot of bad attitude. Keep watching! Today we have the story of Tibet and another badass Brit. Hi, tell me about This him. is the 13th Dalai Lama in 1903. We're all reincarnations of each other, so time is irrelevant. But I was the one that Francis' young husband forced out of Tibet in 1904. Nothing personal? In fact, although I was a bit dismissive of the power of the Lamas, I came to understand the love of God while in Tibet and slaughter 2,700 Tibetans in the process. Ignorant races are like children. Now and then they need a good hard thwacking to teach Whoa, them some Mr. discipline. Mr. Young Husband, that's not cool! Sir Francis Young Husband to you, leader of the British it's expedition to Tibet cool. in 1904, and you, sir, safe in your little bubble, have no idea what our situation was. My name is George Nathaniel Curzon. I'm a most superior this person. This is Lord Curzon. The Viceroy of India. And only 46. That, as you say, is cool. So I'm told. And in 1903, I asked my friend Frank to take a diplomatic mission to Tibet. It was an invasion force. Considering that the Tibetans had been sending troops into Sikkim, harassing and looting the Sikkimese, and had not complied with a treaty the Chinese negotiated for you, we were not consulted. I'm General Zhao Erfang of the Chinese Imperial Army, and I can tell you, that the Tibetans are barbarians. They have been regularly attacking Chinese citizens for years and are filthy, ignorant, stubborn, and ungrateful. They attacked the Nepalese in 1883. Exactly. All along their borders, they are nothing but trouble. Gyantse, the turquoise valley, is filled with marauding outsiders. Oh, when I see such things happen, I wonder, what is the use of gathering riches? Yeah, I won't even go into the grievances that Bhutan had with them. I'm Tongsa Penlob Oigen Wangchuk. I offered my services to the British to assist in their negotiations with Tibet. And in 1907, my friendship with the English enabled me to become the hereditary ruler of Bhutan. My family still rules Bhutan even in the 21st century. The Bhutanese were just looking for an excuse to go looting. I thought this episode of Amazing History was all about me. Now, if you're interested, I too was only 46. And up till then, I discovered new passes through the Himalayas, been awarded many honours for exploration. My books were bestsellers. I'd been the British resident for Chitral and been a correspondent for the Times. Not to mention nearly starting a war with Russia. I am badass cool. Okay, everybody is cool. You can see why I was talking to the Russians. Strictly speaking, you were talking to me, Lama Agvan Doshi. Too can... many weird names. Lawrence, where are you? You're the one who wanted to do this, dude? I wanted us to do the Mongols. As a matter of fact, Dorjev was a Mongolian monk from Lake Baikal and thus a Russian citizen. In Spiritual Guide to the Tsar. Well, so was Rasputin, so it's not exactly a recommendation. I was a thorn in the side of Stalin, which didn't end well for me. Uh, but that must be worth something. Whatever he was, he was setting up an arsenal of Russian weaponry in Lhasa, in preparation for a Russian assault on India. Now, unfortunately, all we ever found were a few Russian rifles. Not to mention a few American rifles as well, though uh, these were hardly weapons of mass destruction. Lawrence, is this history because it sounds like... like well, uh, well, it's like you're having a recurring dream. Yeah, history is biting me in the ass. They could be talking about North Korea or Iraq, except they sound more racist. Well, racism was the uh, political correctness of the era. But, but you admire guys like Young Husband. 
You have to admit that they had balls, if nothing else. All balls and no brain. Yes, and, uh, and yet they still ruled the world. Ruled? That is an illusion. So I came to believe. I began as the repressed product of a British public school and ended up supporting Gandhi, Indian independence, and most importantly, free love. Free love? You mean you were the first hippie? No, oh, he was. <laughs> ah. And I ceased being a Christian, as it was obvious there was no benevolent God, and came to believe in a mystical life force that compels the enlightened to impose order, prosperity, and freedom, and the unenlightened to create chaos, poverty, and servitude. His unwanted arrival in Lhasa made him realize all this. It must have been the thin air. Yes, that and the uh, massacre of unarmed Tibetans at Guru in Tibet. Massacre? It was a terrible and ghastly business, but it was not fair to call it a massacre of unarmed men, for photographs testified that the Tibetans were all very well armed. Well, fierce they might be, but you had machine guns and uh, the Tibetans had matchlock muskets uh, that weren't even lit and primed. A large body of armed Tibetans blocked our way. I invited them to allow our diplomatic delegation to pass. I ordered my men to push their way through. The Tibetans slowly yielded to the admonitions of our troops and allowed themselves to be shouldered out of their position and be moved on as London policemen would disperse a crowd from Trafalgar Square. But one of their generals took offence at an Indian officer trying to move his horse and whether deliberately or not, the general shot him in the face. At that point, fighting broke out and the Tibetans began hacking at our men with their swords. Within a few minutes, 13 rounds from our Maxims were fired. They killed 600 of our men. I advise the Dalai Lama to come with me to Mongolia for his safety. The Tibetans kept telling us that they would meet us to negotiate, and led us into a series of firefights, sieges, ambushes, and I had all too many close shaves. Worse still, the British newspapers arrived at my camp. The mission was accused of cruelty and injustice, and said to be another Afghanistan disaster waiting to happen. Afghanistan? Well... In 1879, the entire British consular staff in Kabul were massacred. The Indian frontier was a notoriously treacherous place. It still is, for that matter. I was beginning to feel that I was going to be abandoned, like General Gordon in Khartoum. It was all a bit of an embarrassment, really. When the British got to Lhasa, there was nobody there of any real authority to negotiate with. So they grabbed some representatives from the governing council. They don't look too happy! Don't, Don't talk, talk to us, us. We, we know, know nothing. nothing. They said they had no authority and couldn't even agree about what they disagreed about. Young husband found himself being given the runaround and kept thinking that sooner or later he would be in a meeting and 6,000 monks would burst in and slaughter everyone. Eventually I turned up, the Thai Rinpoche. I had the seals of office and was the chief doctor of divinity and metaphysics of Tibet. I took it upon myself to act as regent. Various agreements were made regarding trade, the occupation of the Chumbi Valley, and reparations. But most importantly, the Tibetans agreed not to make treaties with foreign powers that harmed British interests. We had no intention of signing treaties with anyone anyway. So on that matter, I knew we could agree. Then I gave everyone a little Buddha as a present and told them that whenever they look upon this, I hope they will think kindly of Tibet. And that was it? The British held a few wheelbarrow races. What? And uh, they did a bit of shopping. Apparently the Tibetans discovered the joys of ripping off soldiers, selling them souvenirs, and uh, the British then went home. A complete waste of time! A destroyer of careers too! Uh, Lord Curson cut short his career as Viceroy and tried to become the Prime Minister. A big demotion! Indeed. And young husband decided to get out of India and run for Parliament. Terrible to have to think so, though. Wait. You may see the most important part. After the treaty was signed, I went to the Jokung Kang Temple. Here it was that I found the true inner spirit of the people. The Mongols from their distant deserts, the Tibetans from their mountain homes seemed here to draw on some hidden source of power. And when, from the far recesses of the temple, came the profound booming of great drums, the chanting of monks in deep reverential rhythm, the blare of trumpets, the clash of cymbals, Stop. and What's the long going rolling about? of lighter drums, well, he's, he's I seemed to catch a glimpse moment. of the source from which they drew. He's giving me a headache! Uh. 
The government might have disowned him, but the Americans now loved him. That figures. Touring the US, giving lectures at $100 a head, he recounted his adventures and grew even more convinced that the religious fervour of the Englishman needed stirring up. They must have been desperate for entertainment. During the First World War, he set up patriotic organisations to bolster morale with stirring pageants, speeches and songs, and out of this emerged England's alternative national anthem, Jerusalem. And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here amongst these dark satanic mills? These words are a bit weird for a national anthem. Yes, uh, it's a poem by um, uh, an opium adult William Blake. Uh, they sing it at every Conservative Party conference. Which is rather apt, don't you think? I wanted the English to take religion as seriously as the Tibetans and Indians. Why? You consider the natives ignorant children that the English had a duty to rule? After Tibet, I changed my mind. Imagine what an Englishman could do if fired up with the sort of conviction a Muslim had, or a Tibetan monk. After I had concluded all business in Lhasa, I went off alone to the mountainside and gave myself up to all the emotions of this eventful time. My task was over, and every anxiety was past. The scenery was in sympathy with my feelings. The unclouded sky a heavenly blue, the mountains softly merging into violet, and as I now looked down towards that mysterious purpley haze in which the sacred city was once more wrapped, I no longer had any cause to dread the hatred it might hide. I was insensibly suffused with an almost intoxicating sense of elation and goodwill. This exhilaration of the moment grew and grew, till it thrilled through me with overpowering intensity. Never again could I think evil, or ever again be at enmity with any man. All nature and all humanity were bathed in a rosy, glowing radiancy, and life for the future seemed naught but buoyancy and light. Such experiences are only too rare, and they but too soon become blurred in the actualities of daily intercourse and practical existence. Yet it is these few fleeting moments which are reality. In these only we see real life. The rest is ephemeral, the unsubstantial. And that single hour on leaving Lhasa was worth all the rest of a lifetime. After the British left, I returned to find a Chinese garrison. Remember me? I'm Zhao Erfong. I was sent to assert Chinese control over Tibet. The Tibetan barbarians were hunting down Chinese and even Christian missionary converts and missionaries and slaughtering them. So much for enlightenment. Zhao the Butcher we know him as. His troops went on a rape and pillage rampage against Tibetans. And in 1910, Zhao chased me all the way to Darjeeling, and I was declared deposed. It was all good practice for my later incarnation. We spent all that effort trying to induce the Tibetans to be ordinarily civil. And now the Grand Lama and his entire government come to us, come to beg us to uphold their right of communicating directly with us, and to send British officers and not merely officers, but soldiers, to Lhasa, and to form an alliance. What did the Brits do? Well, the government tightened up control of the Indian government and, and refused to allow them to do anything. The British electorate was ignorant of the needs of India. That is when I realised India needed to be independent. What a drag democracy is, eh? How strangely familiar all this sounds. Yes, well, it's amazing, really. That's because this is Amazing, Amazing Histories! Yes, Amazing Histories. 